Hi, I'm Rhett. Today we're gonna to talk about the number one mistake that people make when they do website personalization. And I'll also show you the six steps you can take to avoid that mistake. We'll also use a couple examples and a case study to walk through to help illustrate how to do this. I'll also show you the AL personalization method, which is your key to not making personalization mistakes. Website personalization is when a business will show content or an experience to a visitor because they think that experience is better. They, they have information about a visitor and so they show them something thinking that that will improve their customer experience and hopefully give them more conversions. The challenge with this is there's a lot of things built into showing those assumptions and the whole industry has a lot of assumptions built into doing website personalization. We've all had that experience where someone knows something about us and so they show us some piece of content. And, and oftentimes it feels creepy. We're like, whoa, hey, you're personalizing in a way that's a little too much for me, back off. Um, so, so you have to be aware that the industry is pitching this personalization thing as, hey, this will solve everything. You do what you can do because you know this visitor. But in reality, it has to be done strategically. Here's an example of why this is difficult. The industry says, hey, personalization allows you to show the right content to the right person at the right time. And you have these people here like, hey, that's good for me, click. That's good for me, click. And in theory, that sounds great. The challenge is it's very hard to do in practice. When I was a consultant at, at Adobe, one of my clients was staples.com. And the CEO had mandated that they should do website personalization. And so their optimization team, their analytics team, their marketing team, they all got together and they came up with a plan for how they should personalize. And despite what we said, we were the consultants, they were paying us to consult them and help, help them do it right, the right way, to give them the best practices and guide them through this experience. And the, the route they chose was to just show content to visitors without testing it, without getting data. And despite all of our recommendations to the, to the contrary, they went ahead with this plan because the CEO had asked them to do it. And so we begged, we pleaded, we taught, we tried to educate, we helped them see that what they were doing wasn't going to give them the value they wanted in the long run, but they were under the charge of the, of the CEO and so they just did it. Well, as it turns out, two years later, they, they had done all this personalization over two years and the CEO was like, well, what do we have to show for it? What, what value has this done? What impact has this had? And the truth was they didn't know. And so they stopped their personalization program after two years of putting extensive resources, time, and energy into creating some personalization campaigns and doing something that ended up not having an impact. So the moral of the story here is they made, the Staples made the number one personalization mistake. They assume they know what to personalize to their visitors. And because they assume they know what works, they don't measure or try alternative experiences. Here's another example of a company that they, they say, hey, per website personalization is easy to do and you know something about your visitors, so you might as well personalize to them. Visitor 4003 found your website by searching the internet for the term big airship for sale. He's about to land on your homepage, which displays the same generic content you show to everyone who finds your website. But hold on a minute. Don't we already know something about Visitor 4003? Sure we do. We know he's looking for an airship, so let's focus the page on that. It's also clear that size matters to this visitor, so let's list them in size order. Now, when Visitor 4003 arrives at your site, he's welcomed by content tailored to his specific interests and aims. What an impact that will have. So this is building all kinds of assumptions into what the experience wants. Hey, this person is searching for a big airship. Why don't we just show them airships? Hey, we know they want a big one. Why don't we filter by size? But that's what the industry pitches. Hey, you know something about this person. You might as well just show them what you think they should see based on what you know about them. It's a very, very limited view of personalization. Maybe it's true. Maybe the visitor does want a big airship. However, assuming that we just give them the airship um, without, like, are there alternative products? Maybe, maybe the budget's the problem. Though they want a big airship, maybe we need to show them the smallest price first. Um, maybe it's not about the airship itself, but it's about the qualities and the features. And so anytime that we just assume something will work, because that's what because we have one little piece of data about a visitor that's when we get challenges that's when we potentially set ourselves up to make mistakes you may have heard of the darwin awards those are the awards they give to people who do really stupid things that ends up getting them killed basically the theory that they are self-eliminating from the population um, for example you may have heard the person that um, they were in a nasty divorce and they were going to lose their house to their spouse so instead of giving them the house, they decided they would go in and burn the house down, but they didn't give themselves time to get out of the house, and so they ended up dying in the burning house that they set on fire themselves. Website personalization is kind of like that. Sometimes we think we have a great plan, there will be an amazing experience, and it ends up just hurting ourselves. 
So let me illustrate why this doesn't work. If you're going to personalize, you have to have three things. You have to know who you want to personalize to. You have to have an audience. You have to know what you want to show them and you have to know where you want to show it. The problem is there's an infinite number of combinations this leads to the who, like, do I show first time visitors or new visitors or people with an account or people on who came from Google or people who come you know, when they're in the Firefox browser, the Chrome browser, or people who have some certain cookies or visit other websites or came from a paid campaign. The who is endless. It goes on and on. And then you have the what, what do you show? Well, is it a message? Is it a call to action? Is it a promotion? Is it a discount? Is it an offer? Is it some special thing that they should sign up for? You also have to know where. The where is in this as well. You have sites and you have apps. Um, do you do it on your homepage? Do you do it on your landing page? Do you do it on your product page or your sign up page? Do you do it in the top navigation or the, the hero banner? Or do you do it below the fold? Do you do it as they're checking out? Like there's all these places where you could do it. So the, the what, the where, and the who all combine to create an infinite number of combinations. And because of the infinite amount of combinations, anytime we assume we know the right place, the right person, and the right thing to show to personalize, that's a pretty big assumption. We're, go, we're just basing that on tons of guesses because of the infinite possibilities that are out there. The other problem with this number one mistake that people make is they, they don't measure alternative experiences when they just assume what works. And so the, the cost trade-off of personalizing to an, an, a small audience becomes very large. Now, well, I'll give an example of why that's so, um, so bad. Basically, if you have 100% of your population, suppose you had 1,000 visitors on your, that comes to your site monthly, just for the ease of math. And suppose you're running a test and you get a 20% lift. Say your standard conversion rate is 10% and you, the 20% lifts that to, lifts that conversion rate to 12%. So now your 20% lift gives you 120 conversions per month because you have a thousand visitors per month. Now suppose that you're going to personalize to an audience. Suppose that the audience is fairly large. It's um, 40% of your total audience. So now of the 1000 monthly site visitors, you're going to personalize to 400 of those site visitors. To get that same value um, as, as testing to the entire audience, your impact would have to be much larger. So the 20% lift led to 20 extra conversions. To get that same 120 conversions with 400 members of your audience, you have to have like a 200% lift to get that same value. So when you reduce the audience, you have to increase the lift to make up for the benefit of, of reducing the audience. So that's another reason why without measuring, Anytime you assume an audience that's smaller than the total um, population that you're, that you could test with, you actually increase the amount of lift that you have to get to improve the experience, which makes it very difficult. So that's the second issue with just personalizing by assuming you know the audience is the infinite combinations of who, what, and where. And then the reduction in audience size makes it much more difficult to get the same value as if you just optimize to your entire audience. Okay, I want to walk you through an example of someone that did it right. About a month ago, uh, a client that I worked with came to me and they said, we want to personalize on our homepage because we have people who have created an account and are members and have logged in and we have visitors who come to the site and they're not members. They haven't created an account. They haven't logged in. And the hypothesis that they had, the business question was, we think that those people who aren't logged in, who haven't created an account, should have a different experience than people who have created an account. Now I'm going to pause there. On the surface, this sounds like a great idea, right? We know something about this visitor. Some are members, some are not members. We know that they have an account and some don't. And so you'd say, that's, that's probably true. We probably should personalize or give them a new experience. And so the product manager came to us and said, let's, let's, let's personalize. We have two variations that we've designed. One's for members, one's for those that are not members that have not created an account. And we want to show these two experiences. And so on the one, on the variation that was for members, you had, you had tools specific to them that they can only use behind the login. On the one that was for people who haven't created an account, you had things like, hey, are you new here? Maybe you want to chat or maybe you want to learn more. Here's some basic information. And so you had these icons that were trying to point them in the right direction based on who they were. So again, on the surface, it sounds like a pretty good test. Um, but I want to walk you through what we actually ended up doing because this product manager was very wise. We talked about it and we said, hey, we can show this experience to these people and, and target them so that the members get one thing and the non-members get another thing. But the challenge is, without comparing to alternatives, we'll never really know if that worked. So I wanna to talk to you about these, the six steps that we need to do. That was step one. 
Step one is to, as, as my friend James Nalder says, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And what I mean by that is number one is check your assumptions. What are we assuming if we, we run this test? Well, we're assuming that members and people who don't have an account need different experiences. Again, it's a good hypothesis, but it's still an assumption at this point. We haven't proven that through testing. Step number two is to check your audience size. As we talked about, if you have a small audience size that you're going to personalize to, the gain that you have to create to compensate for the smaller audience size is much larger. And so before you just personalize to an audience, you want to make sure that the audience is very large. Um, you start with a large audience first, of course, and you have to compare that and measure that against the value of just optimizing to the population as, as a whole. So step number three is to design your variations for the audiences that you think will work. And what I mean by this, so this, the, the product manager actually did this in the example we were talking about. Um, he had designed a variation for those that didn't have an account, and he had design, designed a variation for those that did have an account. That's actually what you want to do. So you want to create a new variation for those visitors, and one of them should be the generic one, one of them should be the personalized one, and personalized for each audience. And then once you have that, you get to step four. Step four is the key part. This is the critical step that most people miss, miss when they're doing website personalization. Step four is allowing all your visitors to see all your variations. And you may be like, whoa, that doesn't make sense. This is how you check your assumptions. You have to make sure that each audience responds positively to that variation. But the only way you can check your assumption is if you allow other audiences to also see that variation. Now, this, this is the exciting part. If you're right in your assumption, in your original idea that personalization or this personalized experience is good for this audience, what you'll see in the test results is you'll see that audience doing really well with that variation. If that's the case, great. You succeeded, you, you were right, you keep optimizing, you keep moving on. However, what usually happens is the audience you thought would win with that variation often doesn't. Or you might see a different audience respond. And so you allow all visitors to see all variations and then you segment after the fact to see which audience segment did the best with each variation. That's step four. Allow all audiences to see all variations and see which audience does the best. Step five is really interpreting results based on the pattern that the audience has had. And what I mean by that, so in this example, again, we showed a member and, an, and a, a non-member experience. And what we found was that the, the member and the, the people that didn't have accounts, the, the just regular visitors, their pattern of behavior was exactly the same. And so you can see this kind of arching pattern in the results. What that means is that we didn't influence their behavior by giving them this custom experience. Now that's what you want to see to disprove the idea. If we had seen something different, if we had seen um, one audience respond differently than the other, then that would have been the case for personalization. But what we saw was the exact same pattern. And so by seeing the same pattern, you're able to prove or disprove the value of this personalization experience. So that's step five. Look at the pattern and see if the pattern is the same or is it different between the audiences in question. So step six is to evaluate what you learned. In this case, we saw the pattern was exactly the same. We did some more analysis on it. We looked at the heat maps. We saw that people weren't actually engaging in this content. Some people might say your personalization experience failed. And, but the true answer is no, it didn't. We learned what didn't work. And whenever you learn what doesn't work, you learn something valuable and you get some next steps. And so as a takeaway, we realized that we needed to create some drastically different experiences to personalize. And so we're doing that now. We're working on some next steps and we're going to create some new variations to, to continue this experience to see, well, what does make this non-account member, this new visitor to the site, what does help them respond positively? And we're going to figure that out um, so that we will be able to personalize to them and give them a custom experience that meets their needs. In the meantime, though, we learned a lot with this test. We learned that what we did didn't work. We learned that we need to try something else. We had data now that backs this and we're not going on assumptions and gut checks but we have something tangible that the organization can use to make informed decisions moving forward. And that's why this product manager did a great job. He didn't just rely on his guesses and opinions and his desires. He used, he allowed himself to follow a data driven approach and he, he got results back. that are now helping take really good action steps moving forward. Okay. So those are the six steps. I just want to summarize real, real quick because they're all very important. <laughs> Step number one and two, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Step number one, check your assumptions to make sure you're not assuming things where you don't have data. Step number two, check your audience size to make sure the, the personalized audience will be large enough if it does make sense. Step number three is to actually design variations that you think would be good for that personalized audience. 
Step number four, the most important, show each of those variations to all audiences so you can segment after the fact, which is step number five, segment after the fact and see if the pattern of behavior is the same or different. If it's the same, then you realize that personalization didn't make sense in this case. If it's different, you may now have a case for personalization. And step number six, take what you learned, make a plan of action, and use what you learned by following this disciplined data-driven approach to make a new plan of action to get closer towards personalization. So now I want to hear from you. When have you been personalized in a way that didn't make sense? And what did you do about it? Also, if you like this video, please hit the like button. Hopefully this is valuable. If you learned something new, if you had an insight or an aha moment, hit the like button. Um, I also make videos every Thursday. I post them every Thursday. So please subscribe so you can get the, the future videos coming up. And then finally, if you want to visit me at testingtheory.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. You can sign up to get insider strategies. And, and I'd love to see you there. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Remember, Testing Theory is the place where businesses come to get better A-B testing and higher conversions. 